So, yes. fuck yes. Welcome to After the Hype. With me, your host, as always, Brian Dressel. With me, as always, is Jonathan Hardesty. Annunciation. Emily Blake. Hello. And Samantha Garrison. Hello. Uh, I, I heard the two R's in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I decided not to fuck this one up. Um, I think I did pretty great. Well, now people know what the podcast actually is. I can't find it on iTunes. <laughs> They are already downloading it. It's not like they're like, oh, what the fuck did I just download? Welcome to... <laughs> <laughs> it's only like every other episode. <laughs> Most of them these days. Uh, special guest this week. I figure we're doing a movie with Tom Hanks. Who better than to get than Tom Hanks? Howdy! <laughs> Fine. <Partner. laughs> Holy shit. It's him. That was the best Hanks impression I've ever heard. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Mr. Elvis Kunish here. Hi, Elvis. Hi, howdy. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, you've already covered this movie on your show, I assume. I have, yeah. and uh, I did not re-listen to that episode, so I'm guessing this one will be more nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think everyone, anyone has ever described After the Hype as nuanced, but... <laughs> I'll take it. At least my take on it. <laughs> the timing on this episode is really super duper interesting. It, so that should be... Uh, it is. I'm not sure when this one will come out. But just for a frame of reference, this is being recorded three days after the anonymous op-ed for the New York Post Times. And around time. the same time Bob Woodward's book is being released as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. so this is like a few days after that. So just so you know where we are mentally when you're listening to I, this. I this watched this happened. the night after that happened. Yeah. So I was just like, what the fuck? As I was watching it, I was like, oh my God, we're living in this right now. Yeah. And I watched it like, Last night, and I was like, shoot, I missed my chance. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you didn't get the benefit I, of No, it. I missed all the benefit. No. I could have. Emily messaged me. I totally missed all this happening, and she's like talking to me on Facebook, like, you should be watching it right now. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to watch it later. Although it's really Yeah, yeah I was really like, oh, man, I can't believe we're doing this movie the week this happened. And Brian was like, week what happened? And I was like, oh, boy, I get to be the one to tell you? <laughs> like, week what happened? That, that Corin started reaching for his mom? Because that's pretty cool to me. No, not national news? Great. <laughs> Hey, it's important. It's important it's to two people. Man's baby yeah. reaches for mom. It does sound like an onion headline. It does, right? <laughs> um, so before we jump into that whole movie thing, we should do a where have you been doing? And I can go first. I rewatched the entirety of The Good Place because I loved season two and I thought season one was pretty mediocre. I thought it was okay and I didn't love it. And then after seeing season two and going back to season one, And knowing the whole point of season one, it was way more enjoyable. Um, I still think the twist is essential for the end of it. I think if you knew it the whole time, the show would not have been, it wouldn't have worked as well. Mm. But knowing the twist and watching it and knowing that this isn't just wheel spinning. This isn't like, ah, we need to get to the end of the show eventually. So we're just going to kill time trying to give Chidi a hobby. Mm -hmm. And that they're actually torturing Chidi by giving him all the hobbies he'd never want makes those episodes way more entertaining than they were the first time through. So if you were like me and you only kind of mildly enjoyed the first season and loved the second, I'm guessing you will love the second, your second time, or the first, your second time. So just have faith it'll pay off. That kind of like, oh, where's this going sort of thing. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying it's... On it's, a rewatch. On a rewatch. Oh, it's, got it. It's phenomenal. On the first time through, you just got to stick through it and yeah, you'll yeah, enjoy yeah. it. And then that's, all like, that's all I meant for yeah. the first time through. Yeah, because I quit before the end of the season and then I had a friend tell me like, no, Go back and watch it, and I did. I did the same thing. Yeah, yeah. it's the one show where the you have to just get through season one is mm-hmm. kind of a legitimate but description. Knowing okay. it and going back, season one is far more entertaining. Yeah, um, those types but, of things fascinate me. There, there could be a whole podcast on that, just that yeah. phenomenon. It's it's weird. But also, it the Good Place has a podcast. And they don't call it the Good Podcast, and that really bothers me. What do they call it? The Good Place Podcast. That's, That's a missed why, opportunity. Why, right? One the, extra word. No, rename your shit. Come on. That's a. You know what? Fuck the Good Place. I rescind re- <laughs> re- my recommendation. I do love that one of the restaurants in the Good Place is called the Good Plates. That's so good. See, See that's they, that's they, perfect <laughs> wordplay. Yeah. Did they like, use the good wordplay yeah, for they that? They were called the Good Place Plates. Yeah. If you, if you go, if you go, if you live in LA and you go to Universal Studios, the Good Place set is part of the Backlot Tour, and it's really fun because you can ride through and see the names of all the stores that they, you don't always necessarily see on camera. It's very cute. That's cool. Next, I'll go. <laughs> I saw the Nun last night. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, it was it was about what you would expect, but I really enjoyed it for what it was. How much universe building is there in it? 
It's a legitimate question. Is it um not much actual? Okay. Well, yeah. No. Wait, did did the crooked man get his own movie yet, or is that no. still happening? It's still mm-hmm. happening. Okay. The woman who's in charge of the Conjuring universe is now taking over the DC universe, so it's a very legitimate question on whether or not she can build a universe. I mean, look, Wait, it, huh? it ties what? into the yeah. other. It ties into the other movies nicely. My favorite thing is that they cast Vera Farmiga's sister Tasha Farmiga as the young postulant, who's the main. That's character. kind of awesome. That's amazing. And, like her, <laughs> there's something that ties her very nicely to Elaine Warren, and the use of their very similar shaped faces and eyes is really it's neat. It provides like a good sense of connectivity, even though they don't state it explicitly. And of course, it's bookended by footage of the Warrens. So, okay, I will see it at some point. I was gonna go tonight, and then we decided to, you know, be a family and not leave our our three months old son to go see a movie instead. I'm actually gonna go right after this. <laughs> And you're going to take corn with. Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> It'll be a bro's day out. <laughs> uh, Emily, what about you? I try, I tried really hard to watch Why No to Earp because all my friends were talking about how great it was. And it was just so melodramatic. They were really eating scenery that I couldn't stay with it. Is that the Natalie um, Portman movie? No, Why No to Earp, <laughs> the TV show on sci-fi about Not the descendant. Of, no, it's no? a TV show on sci-fi. I don't think Natalie Portman would be in a TV show on Wasn't no offense to sci-fi, but because it's one she was in. Why TV. Nona she Earp is in, a TV show. She was in Jane Got a Gun. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. The, oh boy, that movie has a story <laughs> behind it. Okay. Uh <laughs> the history of that movie is a mess. But um no, Why Nona Earp is a TV show on sci-fi as I've now said like 20 times. Um What channel is it on? <laughs> 64. Mississippi. <laughs> Um, and it's about the descendant of why um, of Wyatt Earp, and she's the chosen one who has a special gun that can she she can shoot demons with. And a lot of my girlfriends were talking about it and how great and feminist it is. And I've seen a lot of people talk about great it is. And I was like, all right, I do like sci-fi shows. I do like feminist. I do like you know you know shit about chicks beating demons with guns and whatnot. Uh, it's oh whew. they are acting the fucking pants off i mean like every character is like why nona <laughs> you gonna shoot me now you you descendant of wide up in case everybody forgot what the plot was and it's just like oh my god everybody <laughs> bring it down a goddamn notch if that's what the show is you just sold me if it's <laughs> anything <laughs> less than that i am not watching this fucking you thing. just you just set up way too much hype for this show now <laughs> like i just imagine somebody like with like one eye and just turning in the camera in case somebody forgot and it's like that's oh. pretty close I'd to like, it me oh. i wasn't paying attention it's I pretty forgot. close to it and i appreciate my friends love the show i just i messaged a couple <laughs> people and i was like is is there a mo- how many cuz i got four episodes in and i just eventually i was like how long do I give it before everybody stops overacting? Well, you got to give it to the next season where it pays it off. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate it after the fact. So I'm and sorry. Then you season one and it was great. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just can't handle that level of like up here all the time. Like everyone acting so much and constantly reminding us of who her ancestor is all the time. Yeah. So What's not to like about, about that? that? I tried. John. Uh, I... In the, you know, when I watch these shows on Netflix, it comes from a place of distraction. I can't focus on anything. So, like, I'll watch some of one show and just jump to another show. Uh, Into the Badlands is the one I jumped to next. I was watching Supergirl for a while, and then I was like, I, I don't feel like Supergirl right now. What else can I... Oh, this Into the Badlands. I've heard about it a few times on the podcast. And so I watched the first episode. And it, was, it was pretty fun. Should do Preacher next. Yeah, I might. Yeah. Oh, Preacher's so good. Season three just ended. Woo. Yeah. Good shit, I feel like man. season one and season three are great. Season two... Have, uh, totally. Uh, totally agree. But I still feel like that that fight scene through the hole in the wall in season one is one of the greatest things I've ever seen on television. So good. So good. Yeah. You should watch Preacher. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm in that type of movie where I'll, I'll just start watching things and never finish them. It's perfect. That does, sure. There was, there, was, there was sarcasm in there. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, was that everybody? Did I skip somebody? I haven't gone. Oh, I skipped somebody. I I'm just gonna say I've been watching. Uh, it just premiered season two, Anime Crimes Division. It's a web series by Rocket Jump. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube for free. You can watch it on Crunchyroll. It's hilarious. One of my good friends is the star of it. Uh, you don't have to be into anime to like it. You just kind of like have to like really goofy, dumb body cop. Like kind of tropes. It's amazing. With oh, you've seen it. I've yeah. seen it. Yeah, it's it's incredible. Um, 
And uh, I, I showed it to someone who isn't as into that sort of stuff, and I was like, "This is great. This is like, look at all these references. This is so funny." And they're like, "What? what what's this?" <laughs> And I felt so sad. Okay, maybe that, you do have to be a little into it. That's the that wind out of that recommendation. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but if you're yeah. into it, it's 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 uh, dynamite. You probably already know about it, but if you don't, go check it out. Anime Crimes Division. It's great. I cool. love their opening credit sequence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's all remember it fondly for a moment. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. So good. good stuff. <laughs> what just happened? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was wondering that also. We just spoke to anime the, fans. We're separated girls and guys at the table, and something weird happened on the I've guy never heard of this thing, and I'm probably never going to watch it, but they all seem to be enjoying something okay, really well. well it so seems I like everybody just circle before. jerked over yeah. there. I don't know what's going on. You clearly have never been to a circle jerk. There's a lot more action. <laughs> it's more like, yeah. <laughs> like a crescent jerk. There's at least two people disappointed, or one person disappointed. Uh, let's move into today's episode, which has nothing to do with circle jerks. Uh, we're talking about that. Are you metaphorical circle mm-hmm. jerks? Maybe? Sure. Uh, yeah. Theoretically, um, we're talking about the post. <laughs> circle jerk and post are probably <laughs> two terms that have never been said in a sentence before <laughs> when talking about this movie. Oh, sure. Okay. I was like, I'm sure they have. Post circle. Post circle your jerk. circle jerk yeah. video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, almost post immediately circle after jerk. circle yes. jerk. Let's go watch the post. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great. And cool the down. circle. <laughs> <laughs> they call it circle. And the jerk. <laughs> Oh, if only Tom Hanks was in The Jerk. Uh, well, we'll celebrate it on Steve Martin Luther King Jr. Day. <laughs> <laughs> my upcoming podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> Review us on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> I would love if every other episode was a, a recap of an episode of Luther and then, like, Steve, Steve Martin. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> Oh, that, I that, still think Tom. I still think cruise control about Tom Cruise is something that needs to happen. Well, I mean, I, I have a long career of failed podcasts ahead of me, so we'll get there. Sick. <laughs> yeah, what happens after Tom Hanks? Tom Cruise. Tom, Tom Hanks continues. And then well, no, but like, okay, I guess he's I, already caught up. Now he's just waiting. For yeah, Tom that's Hanks what I mean. Yeah. What are you gonna do to bide your time? Uh, guest star on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we jump into the post, though, we do have to do something we like to call a 30 second breakdown. Yeah. Breakdown. Breakdown. Uh, are you ready for this? The post in 30 seconds? I'm always ready. Here we go, 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 go. All right. So, the post is a movie about the president of the United States lying to the American people and the media, specifically the newspapers, uh, trying to battle against that while he's trying to censor them. And it takes place in 1971. <laughs> I mean, that works. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Vietnam uh, is also a thing that's happening. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give it to him. That, right. that, that works. All right. Yeah. It is, it's the whole movie in there. There's not a whole lot of plot to this movie. No. No. This is a... Uh, Which is, is, yeah, something... Yeah, we'll, we'll get into it. that in a moment. Um, But the place that I need to start with this movie, uh, I, I need to start with this um, because I think this movie... As good as it was, and we can get into the quality of it, it made a huge, crucial fucking mistake at the end of the movie by showing Watergate and not having it be Forrest Gump. Oh my god, I was seeing that the whole <laughs> right? time. Right? No, no, yes. No, no. Yes. yes. I, the missed opportunity of the connected Hanks universe. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Such a fuck Jeez, up. Jeez, no. Like, oh. No. Good, I just, thing they're not going, good thing he's not going to DC to build that universe. Yeah. <laughs> god, I... Just I just throwing the TV to the ground in anger. I, like, the where's only, Forrest Gump? The only thing I could hate more than Ben Affleck is Batman is a Forrest Gump shared universe. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But he is everywhere. It's a great fucking movie. Sam and I will never see eye to eye on it, which is okay. Our friendship will survive. But will you see eye to eye on this movie? I think I so. I think we do, actually. Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> uh, or hey, we did it. Yeah. Tom Hanks brings people together. <laughs> uh, but that's, I just want to get that out of the way, because as soon as it happened, like that's yeah. the only thing I could think of. I'm like, yeah. man, Tom Hanks has already shot this scene before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it looked it looked very similar. It did. When they did the exterior shot, I yeah. was like, this is exactly like the scene from Forrest Gump. Why don't they just use that footage? They didn't have to reshoot shit. Save some money already. Yeah, oh, I like that it did. Fun- <laughs> this movie. I mean, as quickly as it went into print, like as quickly as they put it out, it's yeah. like it wouldn't surprise me if yeah. Spielberg was just like, "Hey, Rob, can I borrow this?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's like he's here. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got a, an amazing Tom Hanks impression and an amazing Spielberg impression already. It's Just, like they're with us today. Yeah. It's the impression podcast. Speaking of like weird impressions, though, um, 
to start with this movie, everyone's accent was so like I'm a newspaper man. And yeah, I I really okay. Like I enjoyed this movie. Cut I thought print. it was really it was way more interesting than I was expecting it to be. I thought it was very deftly handled because there wasn't a lot of plot. But the fucking accents. It was yeah, like... Bob Odenkirk was doing some kind of like, sometimes he'd be like a New Yorker. Yeah. And then the next minute he was just Bob Odenkirk. Well, I, it and was Tom so Hanks was doing his like, I'm a 1940s gumshoe. And also Benedict Cumberbatch is the Grinch. And it was just like, please stop. And like, of course, Meryl Streep is just acting the shit out of everything. Yeah. So she has to do a voice and like... And she I has just, to have her Oscar speech. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it was yeah. like, I, I, and I loved all of it, but it was just so distracting, the, the accents. Honestly, it's like, just, you're American, like, you are just like American people that work in the media. Just be, like, just talk how you talk. I have a theory why they do that, though. Okay. Um, and I think it's because, for, for the perception of the general audi- uh, movie-going audience, this feels so removed in the past that just Hollywood has colored what people talk like. So it's almost like a period piece. So of course they're going to talk like cartoon characters. Cause this, whenever Spielberg does a movie like this, it's like shorthand for history. It's like when you watch a movie about <laughs> Romans notes. and everyone's yeah, got yeah. a British accent. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was just, it's just weird. Cause it also takes place at the same time. Like for me, it was also jarring. Cause it takes place around the same time as Mindhunter, which I've been really into. Mm-hmm. And everybody in Mindhunter just sounds like a person. <laughs> Yeah. Cause even I think even one of the actresses is in common or something, and it's got like they got the fashion right, and you know like it all takes place in offices and important people are saying important things, except they're saying them like normal people. That's one of the <laughs> lessons I remember from watching A Knight's Tale. Oddly, is because in A Knight's Tale they talk like normal people. They have like the Nike swoosh in there. They have like they when they dance to that David Bowie song, they're dancing like more like a modern day. Because uh, in the commentary, the director says that it was like. Um, it was meant to, to to be like to them that was their modern day dancing in those uh, the fancy moves that we always see from ballroom dancing back in the day. That's exactly how like they would have seen our da- the way we see our dance is like how they would have yeah. seen theirs. And like yeah. Shannon was, Sossaman was a fashion icon, so of course yeah. she's wearing weirder shit than it's the rest. Just yeah, the, it's so just I, the TARDIS well, translating it for you. Yeah, well, <laughs> but I thought that was a good lesson in filmmaking is that when you do a period piece, that to the people in that time they don't know they're in a period piece. They sure, think right. they're in modern day, so treat it as such. Worked yeah. a great effect in uh, the last temptation of christ too. <laughs> uh honestly the the accents didn't bother me at all the wigs did mm. yeah yeah because there's something about like david cross with david hair cross, just right? looks weird it was weird <laughs> It was I, really, I up, it was like upsettingly weird. Yeah, yeah like, but Granted, it wasn't just him. It was like everyone had some sort of like old school like dusty wig on. It was just like to be fair david cross his wig wasn't as weird as it was in Goliath season two. Sure, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I had to work on something with that, and it was yeah. like, it's like, is that thing just a lot? Like, is it dead on you? Is that like <laughs> what? What happened? It's but it's big. But it, and for, this is they were really driving home those parallels to Trump. Like everyone has hair that yeah. <laughs> looks like it's from the Uncanny Valley. Right. But it was it was weird because I noticed it, and like the the accent since everyone was doing a weird old school gumshoe accent, I'm like, all right, that's just the world of this movie. But every like everyone having weird fake hair for some reason it just bothered me. And like you you know it's a Spielberg movie when like the small details are what are bothering you because like yeah. right. for a movie with virtually no plot, it's incredibly engaging. Like yeah. the whole way through, it's like you're basically just watching. Like you could argue one day of a job. Like there's more than one, but the heart of the movie is all we have the documents. We want to publish them. Are we going to or it's, not? It's it's mm. all contained within a week. Yeah, yeah. like except that's... for the prologue. Obviously. Yeah, the prologue. The last twenty minutes is way extended. It's like, like we could tell you wanted to do film World War Two again. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> but like uh, there. Yeah, the, the beginning and the end they are different times, but I think the the major like push of it is that evening where they're trying to figure out whether or not they're going to publish these articles. Oh. And like, there's, I remember just like pausing at one point to go feed Corin, and I was like, "Holy shit, I'm almost done with this movie!" Like, I thought I was just like starting it. It moves, ri- <laughs> it moves at such a good clip. Yeah, and it's two hours long, so it's not a short movie, but it, it's engaging. It's it's the right length, I would argue. Like, it doesn't, like, overstay its welcome. Like, I think some of the Spielberg stuff tends to do sometimes, especially his more late stuff. Um, it was just kind of nice to have and the camera, that style of filmmaking. The camera work that made it feel so dynamic didn't feel like camera tricks. Because that was... There's a, a lot of long, ta- long yeah. uh, tracking yeah, shots. Yeah, but it didn't feel like 
so much so often that feels like showing off and this was just like no they're just following people like i didn't always notice whereas like in contrast to like seeing the nun last night where it's like we're gonna make you scared with a 360 shot it's like yeah this is beautifully done but i know what you're doing yeah whereas like i was just it felt so immersive yes exactly yeah and john williams score really i love how dramatic his stuff is and it never just sounds like hans zimmer's electro farts you know it was just so (laughs) nice to have a when they're like hoisting the newspapers into the van and it's like like you know it's like very dramatic and it's like yeah yeah, this is fucking dramatic. <laughs> However, I, what, one of my... I have two complaints about this movie. One is I had a really hard time understanding what the fuck they were talking about for the first, like, until the papers actually enter into the picture. Sure, yeah. yeah. I was, like, yeah. really confused about it, what we were I was, all talking about. I was very about. lost until it, that It kind of requires a little bit of homework to dive yeah. into it. And and the other thing is I do feel like there there it, it does feel immersive and there are some cool camera shots, but the whole way through the movie I just kept thinking about... Because there's been a lot of movies about newspapers. And uh, I kept thinking about other movies I'd seen that kind of did it better. So I, I know I'm talking about Spielberg, but like, <laughs> definitely <laughs> newsies news. for sure. Newsies. I mean, obviously <laughs> they got newspapers. Is like they got newspapers. They dance on them. Uh, they dance on them. <laughs> but, um, but, but I were... just I just kept thinking about other movies I grew up with about because I was a journalist for a brief period of time. I was a journalist in high school and college, and then I became a journalist for real for five whole months before I realized that. Uh, in the real world, working on a newspaper is largely sitting in a cubicle, making phone calls, being yelled at by your bosses every time you make a mistake, uh, and interviewing people who don't want to talk to you um, about boring shit like petroleum. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, that's the world. I, I I don't know. I saw movies like... like um, all the president's men when I was young and that inspired me to want to get into journalism. And when that didn't turn out to be what it was really like, I was really disappointed and I bailed, but I don't know if I'd seen the post, if that would have inspired me to go into journalism. I don't know that felt very like, Ooh, newspapers are awesome. But I don't think that was like, you watch all the president's men with, that's that's the one about Bob Woodward, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that one. That's also about Nixon fucking up. Exactly. Yeah. The very kind of parallel-ish yeah. movies, but like that one, I feel glorifies what it is to be a newspaper yeah. and to tell the truth and that sort of stuff. And this one felt more of the importance of not lying to the country, and the best way to do that is by using the media. Not necessarily glorifying. And the weird danger of the free market infringing on the free press. Mm, sure. That's yeah. true. Yeah, really absolutely. fascinating. Yeah. Like, yeah. Re- yeah. But it, you guys know how much I love talking about capitalist yeah. hellholes. This was <laughs> tickling my little socialist but, fake heart. Like, but yeah. there's, there's something to be said where I don't feel like this movie's goal was to glorify the newspaper. Mm. It, it felt more of like glorifying truth in free access to information. Which, which and, does, for me, make the accents and the heightenedness of some of that element weird because those are almost like the accents are there to glorify that time period like to, and those the, the, newspaper the, tropes those yeah. newspaper tropes and it's just like i was like okay you're going for that but then you're kind of coming at me with this like more subdued take that ultimately kind of like i don't know it just doesn't never seem to gel it, i got once they got the papers and i could kind of get past the accents and we get to the the tenseness of it it worked but it was those elements like just that not glorifying it, but then having all this like glorification of like the accents, the hair, do the weird like here's this like I don't think any of that was glorifying it though. That was just the movie. Like, but I think it's using things that, are, that you would use accents. to glorify those times. Like look at the, that grand way we used to speak back in the day. Like it's using those tricks, and then like not following through with it. I don't know. I don't know what they didn't follow through on. Well, they just didn't glorify. Like they they were using those techniques to glorify the press and that that time period, but. They didn't like they kept okay. it more subdued. That's that's kind of what I'm saying. Like that, that that mix didn't quite gel. Sure, I, like they were treating it like an all the president's men style film in their performances, but really it was something more nuanced, like spotlight. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, but that's like there's so many different. Like Emily said, there's so many different movies out there about so many different things about the newspaper, and a lot of times it usually ends on the side of journalists are fucking heroes. Mm. Let's all like. <laughs> Have a circle jerk to journalists. Circle jerk. Yeah. Circle jerk. Yeah, I wanted to bring it back. The word of the day. Yeah. (laughs) 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 I I don't feel like this one ever did that. Beyond Tom Hanks' character where he's like, you know, he is like the driving force for all journalists need to be like the spear of truth jutted through America. The adult we wish we had in the room right now. Yes. Uh, Like beyond that, like it never really felt like it was that sort of 
movie, which I kind of appreciate because I've seen that movie. I've seen that movie a thousand times to the point where I hear movies coming out about a newspaper and I just go, pass. That's why I didn't see the post until mm. yesterday when I watched it for this. Ouch. I'm also <laughs> really glad this is strange, but it's kind of to your point that the beginning was confusing. I'm really glad I watched it at home because I tend to watch things with subtitles. <laughs> I do too. Um, just because it's like when it is a lot of information being thrown at me, it's often easier to read it and then yeah. appreciate the performances. Like, you know, I get the truth of the scene one way or two different ways. Sure. You know, instead of trying to mush it all together into one thing. I don't know. Makes me sound like I'm slow on the uptake or something. No, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I watch a lot of things with subtitles. And I was this one in particular, I was really glad I did because the beginning was throwing so much at you. Oh, yeah. And I kept pausing it because my fiance is like, um, he studied law and in particular constitutional law in college. So I was like explain this <laughs> like tell me what's happening you know history better than me so i kept i had like running commentary yeah, i think if you didn't this was a movie made for older people if you didn't live through this you'd probably be like what the fuck are we talking about so i didn't live through it but you understood the whole time what everybody was talking about yeah oh well good for you yeah i mean I fucking did. but it was just I, i've done I had to do research on it in high school and one. Oh, so like well, I've just okay. I've had to pay attention. You're familiar with the yeah. Material. I'm familiar with the material. It's really, but I agree with you. I, I think yeah. like if you didn't have to sit through those classes and stuff that I did, like I had no idea. What if you were. exactly if you didn't live through it or if you haven't specifically studied it, they don't help you in the beginning. Yeah. Like until like you like we've been saying until the major we have the papers we're going to write an article plot kicks off. You have a MacGuffin. You're, yeah, you're in the dark. Yeah. See, it was. Oh. the with the first like 30 40 minutes of the movie where it's kind of like shaky and you don't quite in, again as we keep referencing until the papers actually fall into their laps and it and it like you lock on I, I'm kind of confused because like yeah they hit you with so much information I have to wonder if that's why we don't like get outside of a couple beats with like Meryl Streep's character K Graham we don't really get any emotional connection to any of the characters and i yeah, think yeah yeah because like meryl streep i think that's the only emotional connection is it's meryl streep well I, she has and bob, trouble well bob odenkirk's character just because he had like kind of the real struggle in this oh, movie sure. yeah and and i find bob odenkirk just so immediately empathetic anyway i don't like he's just like he's like a poo bear like a human poo bear you're just like i i love you <laughs> well, i think you, yeah you get to that point with with the other characters too yeah. but like you that's know, it. That's this is like Spielberg. It's like everything is functional because you need to see the Vietnam sequence to know, oh, these people are dying, but it, you don't care about it. It doesn't, you know. And this man saw that. Like he was yeah. part of the study. He was on the ground. So mm. I wonder if like there's a reason he chose not to like make it as emotionally involved because we've seen him do that, you know, countless other yeah, times. He, he knows how to do it. Um, or if it was just like, you know, it could have been just like a rushed production. Because he ends up doing it fast. in the end of the movie. Like there's yeah. all that emotional connection. And like those same things, but I don't have it at the beginning. I don't like. I was bored in the beginning. I have to wonder if because I wasn't connecting. I couldn't connect to any one but, person or no. I, I didn't know who they were. But I think it's because he was trying to treat the first third of this thing like news. Yeah, he wasn't trying to give you a okay. point person or something to attach to. He's trying to tell you the facts of what happened as fast as possible to get you into the story that he wants to tell. Uh, along those lines, I f I feel like Kay. You mentioned Kay's character. Mm -hmm. I feel like Kay Kay started out with that potential, and then we 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 really got a good look at the sexism. Yeah. That scene, the one scene I did really like was when they were all in that boardroom together and she was the only woman. And when she had all the fucking answers and, um, and the, oh, who, yeah. who was that, uh, at the head of the table? Um, I don't, the guy leading the meeting was was just ignoring her completely every time she said anything. And then later on, we learned that he just has no respect for her whatsoever. But the interesting thing about that scene in particular, because I don't see Meryl Streep do this often. She usually plays very strong women, which is great. But the one moment where they took a beat and her the guy to her left tried to let her answer and she couldn't do it. Yeah, I didn't see it that way. Oh yeah. Oh, it definitely. I mean, I guess the same way. thing had happened to me. It happened to me in a meeting earlier in yeah. the day. I was just like, I had the right answer. I was pitching my own project, and I was like really nervous because people had been talking over me already, and I was just like, "You just do it." And that's yeah, kind that's of what that's happened. how I saw it. Was that she okay. was just like. It, 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 <clears throat> It wasn't that she couldn't. It's that at that point she'd kind of been so defeated. It was like they're not gonna let me talk. So let it was like so if he talks, it was like I did all this get work. I want the information out there, That's, even if it means giving up. Don't the they all she smiled. She did that fake smile that we all do when we're like, great. 
you know, when you know what's yeah. happening, when you know you've just been silenced and you've just been dismissed. So you smile. You pretend everything's fine. Especially, and it was a really sad smile. That's not yeah. The, yeah. Especially because she is like a socialite woman. So it, she's known for throwing parties. She's known for being polite and a great host. Yeah. She went into host mode instead of boss mode. And I don't like that was a moment where she became like truly sympathetic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why it pays off so well at the end where she's just like, I don't know what to do. What should I do? And then she's just like, and, and it, she's so uncertain of herself until there's a moment where she goes, fuck you. Let's publish. And you're like, yeah, Yay, you yeah. did it. You got there. In that marvelous gold caftan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that was like one of the coolest dresses I've seen in a movie. It was like a superhero cape. I loved it. <laughs> there was that shot um, where she's walking and passes through all the, I think it's the secretaries before going into the boardroom. Mm-hmm. Where it's like it's the what the room she starts off she's walking down the hall and like it's all women and then she goes mm-hmm. into the room with all the men and then is that the same scene is that lead into that scene or is that later that I leads forget. into that scene because yeah because yeah. yeah. that's where for me I was like shit like that was some solid like that got me into yeah. that moment where I kind of was reading it the way you guys are mentioning it that like just do it like she's it was oppressive it was like a moment where the filmmaking was like I was in her perspective for that because yeah. it and- was it was nice it was hopeful and then just oppressive and silencing and just aggressive and it was a very interesting thing Hmm. especially since they're all as is the case in modern political and business everyone's wearing a black suit yeah. Like in men, it's weird how we expect men to all dress exactly the fucking same all the time. It freaks me out, and I hate it. Hey, we can accessorize our ties a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you can wear a flag. presently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the other thing that I thought Meryl Streep's character had to do, uh, and it was definitely helped along with Tom Hanks's speech, but there's something that this movie approaches that I have not seen in many of the other journalism movies that I thought was really important, especially today's times of this movie really brought up the fact that journalism journalists and political figures cannot be friends. They can be civil. They can be friendly, but they cannot have each other's backs if we want to get the truth out there. And there's a speech that Tom Hanks gives, which is his like Oscar clip speech, which is fine. Um, Spielberg always does those and they kind of drive me up the wall, but whatever. Um, but it led to that moment where she's like, yeah, I have all these friends. They're definitely my friends. And I just, I loved that moment that Tom Hanks just like hits her with like, he called you because you own the newspaper and he wants you to defend him. And like, just that, like Meryl Streep's arc in this movie, which is just never fully like laid out, which is something that only, not only Spielberg, but Spielberg does so well of the whole, she needs to completely grow and change and realize who are friends and who are using her. And it turns out almost everyone is using her. And they never say that explicitly. They never try to do anything. It's all done through performance mm-hmm. and reactions. And it's so well done. And I, I, that's why I think I love this movie as much as I did. Because I, I did not expect to enjoy it. And those are the things that I pulled out of it. I'm like, no, that was brilliant. The scene where she confronts McNamara and she's like, you saw my son go. Mm-hmm. You saw yeah. all of our oh, yeah. friend's sons go. And you didn't say anything. It was like she's approaching him at a human level in a way that he never did for her. And it and was never re- would. Yeah. And it was yeah. just so heartbreaking. Cause it was like, it was like, she finally realized it. It was, I thought that that was probably my favorite scene in the film. I, mine would be close between that one and the one before that with Tom Hanks, where he talks about like, Oh yeah. And then, you know, after Kennedy died, his wife looked at me and said, none of this goes in your newspaper. He's like, Oh, that was a great scene. Yeah. And he shit. got that realization. Yeah. Before. Like that moment of like, Oh, I'm a tool. This sucks, and everybody everybody grows in this movie because he's yeah. the, he's the ward you know he's been there but then his wife points out how much harder it is for her yeah I love oh, that scene which so underused crazy. Sarah Paulson yeah don't ever underuse Sarah yeah Paulson. <laughs> she's in like two scenes and barely has any lines it's but when she gets to that scene which is ar- well, another arguable for yeah. the best move scene in yeah. the movie That's true. but yeah I also really liked the scenes between uh, like Bob Odenkirk's arc in this movie made me happy because it turns out he was kind of a real friend to Daniel the the informant Mm -hmm. which that was my favorite part of the beginning I wanted to get to know that character so 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 much more and I know his arc's not particularly cinematic since he was literally doing the same thing every day (laughs) for months but um I, I loved their moments together where they talk about like principles and he says like yeah i'll publish this i'll do what you need because like yeah they had lost touch but he remembered this guy and it this guy really made an impact on him yeah and it was just like yeah they were kind of the unsung duo of this movie and i wanted to see more of them 
There's this great movie. Talk about movies that influenced me. The paper was like probably number one in how it, why I ended up becoming a journalist. But uh, the Ron Howard movie. Um, oh, that's a good movie. Yeah, it's a great movie. And there's a scene. There's a scene where Marissa Tomei is the reporter, and she meets with this Justice Department guy for for a drink. And they're sitting there, and they're making small talk. And then she pauses, and he tells the story, and she fakes laughs at him. And then they pause for a minute. And she goes, "So, Tom, did you bring the list?" And then he's like, and he stops, and he realizes that she just came there to get the information from him. And he goes, did, did you find any one of my stories funny? And she's like, no. And he goes, okay, I just, I just want to know, know where I stood. And she just goes, well, you knew where I when I called. <laughs> and I always thought that was such a great, like, you know, if they're yeah. a reporter, you know what they want from you. And you're right. You yep. can't really be, it's hard to be in a friendship with someone who's always going to want information. And, and that's the transaction. People use journalists. The, the person who did the op-ed in the Times this week used the Times to publish their, you know, their opinion. They wanted it out there. So it, it goes both ways. Yeah. And it, it, this, this movie, and like I've only done my very vague research in like the history of newspapers and whatnot, but I, I did it for a while there because it fascinated me. But this time period was a really big growing up point for journalism and politics because this was a whole lot of like, oh, we need to expose that our government is lying through its teeth to us. And this movie was like, I, I like that this was kind of like, it tells the catalyst of that. Like you can tell the, the Woodward story and all the president's men and all like the, where it all really shit hit the fan. But I like this movie really just kind of centered on the tipping point of like, this is where it kicked off of like, we cannot let the government censor us or we are no longer the check to their balance. Like it doesn't work. Um, and I thought this movie did a really good job kind of just telling that specific point. And I like that Spielberg can do that. Like, he's like, I just want to tell this story. I could tell the really huge one if I wanted to, or I could just trim it down to just this. But it is kind of interesting as we've been kind of going around. Like, he tells that story without, with interesting characters, but not really like a, like, who would you even say the main character of this movie is? There isn't really one. It's more of an ensemble, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, I feel like Streep gets the most arc, but I wouldn't. But she's not. She she's wasn't not the protagonist. In, she was in the middle of the movie. She's like just barely there. Yeah, yeah, she wasn't in it as much as I thought she was going to be. Like mm-hmm. when I saw, I think Hanks has more screen time. Yeah, I think so. Because like when I when I saw the trailers for this, it's just Hanks and Meryl Streep, and that's about it in the trailers. Yeah. It's like look who we got in the movie together. Spielberg directed it. We got these two titans in it. It's Which gonna I, be great. I, I have a comment about that yeah. later. But finish your thought. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because the rest of the cast is great. Like they have Jesse Plemons in there. I love Jesse mm, Plemons. He's great. He's so good. Zach Woods. I, I really loved enjoy it Zach when Woods. the two of them were on yeah, screen. Like, that was such a delight. Like these are younger guys who are like they they could be the next huge actors, but right now they're still just kind of like finding like their niche. And like I liked seeing them pop up in this movie. Like the whole yeah. cast across the board. Allison Brie, right? Allison like, Brie. She, yeah. Her yeah. scenes with Meryl Streep were Super great. Tiny. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very small. Like. <laughs> Small but really role, powerful, but very powerful, when they were important role. Like, yeah, to see her hold her own against Meryl yeah. Streep, I was just, like, I was like so proud of her because yeah. I just love her so much. I was like, you go, girl. Yes, <laughs> that must have been very intimidating yeah. to realize you were about to act with Meryl Streep. Yeah, by just the two of you. Yeah, you know, and, you, and like, like you, you have, have that... to lecture her as yeah. her oh, daughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to talk down to Meryl Streep. Good luck. Uh, wow. <laughs> but you have that, and then you have like Jesse Plemons playing one on one with Tom Hanks. It's yeah, like that's true. these younger new actors playing with like some of the best of the best of the best, and it's very interesting to see how they all kind of work. I together. love that. I love those characters in their scene too, because the stuff that they brought up when the guy's like, "Well, this is why the lawyers are here." I mean, like yeah. it's mm-hmm. because, and it's very true. Is you do have to worry, like legally, they. I mean, the New York Times before they published that op-ed had a lot of fucking discussions with the lawyers. I'm sure they brought one in, and we're like, "Okay, what can we get away?" You know, they know you study the law before you publish it like that yeah. it's very important to always know well and there's uh, definitely a reason it was an op-ed yeah you know exactly. like, yeah. and not a yeah uh, I, I can get into that whole thing later uh, <laughs> grumble grumble um but yeah to, to your point uh about how this is the story he wanted to tell yeah. i think that's actually why there's no main character and yeah, why everybody's a little thin is because he went he really went for clarity with this movie uh, and in that way, I kind of think it's like it's a film constructed like a newspaper and then it has to be a certain uh, 
like fifth they can't grade be friends with level. Them. They can't be friends well, with them. Well, that's yeah. it. Right, right, right. And there, there's a reason that newspaper movies you never, you don't really ever have one character. The closest you get mm-hmm. is all the President's Men, where you have two characters, and even then there are other characters who play huge parts in what happened. Nobody in in a newsroom, you don't. The idea of like one reporter setting out, you people in the newsroom all have pieces. Like the the first the new the first the only uh, professional newsroom I ever worked in, one of the things that was a real problem is they made us work in these really high cubicles. And it was like, why, what? I need to get something from the guy. I need to get information from the guy across from me like all day long, and yet I can't see him. So that's why in newsrooms, you don't see cubicles ever, except that one place, which was stupid. Um, <laughs> because a newsroom is a team. Everybody works together. And that is one thing this movie showed that a lot of news mo- newspaper movies do. But like, it's one thing it showed very well is everybody working as a team. So it would have been not as good probably or not as accurate to have like one person be the hero of the movie because that's mm-hmm. not how it works yeah i think the only movie that i can think of where it's like one guy and even that's still kind of two would be zodiac because mm-hmm. that one's like it's mostly jake Hall mm-hmm. driving it but otherwise yeah it's mostly a team because that makes sense yeah. like the avengers yeah yeah but really <laughs> perfect comparison, comparison. <laughs> uh what haven't we hit on this thing what else uh there, there's so much to kind of dissect in this but well, I, I to go back to what you were saying with the two titans and sure. this being Spielberg, I want to ask you guys a question. Is it weird that the movie that has it's directed by Steven Spielberg and stars Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep is this movie? Yeah. Does it yeah. feel a little it underwhelming? I did, yeah. I forgot that Spielberg directed it. So at the end of the movie, when it was like directed by Steven Spielberg, I was like, oh shit, really? Oh. Like they're all doing really good work, yeah. but when you consider like this pool There's of no talent, dinosaurs in it. <laughs> at all there's, there's not even a dog in it or a pirate ship yeah on uh, second thought i've decided not to endorse this newspaper <laughs> <laughs> it just yeah it just feels like every, everybody's doing good work here but out, outside of probably liz Hanna, the screenwriter no one is like dying for this movie and i think you can kind of tell I, yeah i would agree with you they're all that. masters so that's why it's well, still really good I, it's really I, good I but yeah up for work today yeah, yeah like the, here's the thing is i don't I don't think I've ever seen Meryl Streep give a bad performance. I think she's given less than perfect, but I, she's always good. And I think Tom Hanks is kind of the same way. Like, yeah. They might have movies that aren't great, but they always, when they show up, it's ne- I don't think it's ever just a paycheck for them. I Which, think it, when you hire them, you get them. But I guess the question is like, what drew them, like other than Spielberg well, himself, what drew them to this movie? That's where this movie is so interesting because it feels like a first draft of something that could have been truly exceptional. And I do think it's it's very much a product of its time. Like it's it's like they saw this election season, ha- you know, the past election season happening and stuff. And Spielberg, like, I have this script. How do I get this made quickly, Tom Merrill? Let's do this. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's kind of how it felt. It feels very much like a response to a moment versus like a seminal classic of journalism cinema <laughs> it's also really interesting that this movie chose to tell the story of the post and not the new york times because the new york times were the first ones to get the papers and yet it but it, th- the post is the one that pushed it yeah i know but it's, the, like, it's the, weird the that it was just like so it's very it's sort of passive in the way that new york times got it first and so the whole movie were like well we're not the ones who found them we're the ones who found them again so that it's it's just i don't know it felt, well it, this it was is, an interesting it, choice. it felt like there could have been Two movies. Not this is also movies, but... the response to a cultural moment because this is very much also a movie, like I said, about uh, about what happens when profit could potentially supersede mm. the purpose of a newspaper. Mm-hmm. And the Washington Post did just get bought by Jeff Bezos. Mm. Yep. Like this is very much like there's yeah. so many interesting parallels to draw to today. Like from the Washington Post IPO to now when it's owned by a choder who doesn't even pay taxes. Mm to report on another choder who doesn't even pay taxes. Like, I I just feel like the, it was the more important story to tell, but I wanted, like, another draft of the script or a little bit more did it, need to, did it need to punch more? Did it need to be, like, more, like, sharp? It, I, I, it, it was, to quote Meryl Streep, a first draft of history. <laughs> I would have liked to see more Matthew Reese. I think that's a thing it could have used is a little bit more about the actual person who was risking everything yeah. to come, come out with this. Well, um, that's... I, I feel like you're just... You're all kind of scratching it. It's just, like, I feel like... It's like it's kind of like what Elvis was saying. Like, you have three of them, like the most important people in filmmaking history. You have one of the most important stories in newspaper history. You have all these incredibly important, timely, both to then and now. And what we get is a a good movie. Mm-hmm. Like it, everything feels like you could have punched just one notch higher, and this would have been 
the new All the President's Men for this mm-hmm. generation. Like, it would have been that generational film if we'd gotten more from that character, if we'd gotten more from Tom and Merrill, like, if we'd just gotten more. But since we had this two-hour movie that moves along at a very good pace and it's entertaining and it's, it's disposable enough and it's entertaining enough that we all kind of enjoy it and we can have a good conversation about it, but it still kind of leaves us all wanting. And it's weird that, like, for a movie that's about such challenging things doesn't challenge anything. Either, yeah, cause it's like cause that's, it's working. That's in, Spielberg, though. Yeah, Spielberg that, doesn't it, challenge. Like that's I love I like, him, but and I think that's where it like it loses the thread a little bit for me. Is that I don't know for something like this that's so important, it didn't feel important. You, you know, one thing that 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 I just thought about is when we did our Spielberg battle, the the con constant like common element all our movies had and that we kind of went after was that they all were like wonder. Mm-hmm. It was all about wonder. There's no wonder in this movie. It's all. It's much more. Well, uh, yeah, but that said, like, I'd still rather mm. I'd still rather get a movie like this from him now than Ready Player One. Like, yeah, mm. as much as I enjoy Ready that's Player true. One, but that's just him spinning his wheels. Like, he knows mm. how to do that. He might yeah. do it better than anyone that's else. But point, that's point. I'd rather see him try something and push himself. And I feel like this did that. Yeah. But it's just kind of like I had the same problem with Lincoln that I did with this one. It's like you don't like yeah. I see what story you want to tell, and you're doing a very good job of it. But maybe you should focus on something else. Mm. Is kind of what I got from this one, and they both pushed just one hair too long where we saw the beginning of Watergate we saw the assassination it's like your story ended we don't need this part you don't need to remind us that there's actually a, a very a much flashier scandal coming up than yeah, this like one both and, and, and listen it is a sequel to you yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the thing is like they teased it like it was an MCU two. movie yeah. Yeah. well the post two would be all the president's men <laughs> because yeah I, th- I, I laughed at the end of this movie and because it, it was funny because it was like here we are here's the sequel Watergate happening it felt like a post MCU credit sequ- like sequence are like you're, stay tuned you know Watergate's coming if Sam Jackson had voiced the uh, security guard mm. yeah <laughs> oh my god before he we got a motherfucking eye. breach in this uh, oh god I think these motherfucking flashlights across the fucking street why are you motherfuckers putting tape on the doors <laughs> I, I also wonder if like that approach where it's like it's yeah you're right it's cutesy at the end it goes weird and yeah. cutesy especially that, since it makes you think of Forrest Gump immediately <laughs> yeah well, I mean that's unfortunate for another reason but it just it dilutes any teeth it did have and I think that kind of speaks to the template had more teeth than this movie yeah that they were using for their paper I think the problem is the Pentagon papers in the end the release of them as far as I can tell I mean because Nixon didn't go home over the the Pentagon papers he went home because of Watergate so yeah it's hard to have a really satisfying conclusion to the movie when publishing them was a big deal and nothing really con- nothing that's really dramatic came of it so there's well, what do you do the, the next you go and that's then where Watergate happened. It was, that's where it was unfortunate too because they opened on the Vietnam War and yeah. the Pentagon Papers were what ultimately turned the tide and helped us get out mm. of Vietnam yeah and so that's where it was kind of really unfortunate because you open on this scene of like sacrifice and sadness and like needless death and it would have been I think a better resolution would have yeah. been seeing the boys come home yeah the, yeah cause they insta- for sure because by having that opening, that's the ending that we, as an audience, I would say we earned. Yeah. Um, and instead they went for the, because of this event, all of the Watergate stuff was able to happen. Because mm-hmm. if we didn't set the precedent with this event, mm. the Woodward that's stuff. That's so much more well, abstract. Exactly. But then, but then like, like, you, you have to know history of newspaper and yeah. know like because of this event, this was able to happen. So they just kind of wink at you so, and so say, the, hey, check this well, out. So the movie, too, forgets about the boys coming home. Like, they forget about yeah. the boys just like the government does. And it's like this weird unconscious, like, oops, there was a war? We forgot about this. What do you, what do you so going back to, what, what do you guys think is the purpose of this movie? The intended purpose? Oscar. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's also no, like, whatever. hey, Donald Trump's an asshole and newspapers should, I mean, it's very much meant for right I don't know when they started working on it but they definitely yeah. I mean, geared it toward uh, learning a lesson about how the, the newspapers are not the enemy yeah that, that's I think the main theme of this thing is that you know the newspaper is meant to be a check on power yeah, this is the purpose. Think, you said it a lot so cleaner too. than I just said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the purpose of this was yeah to represent a cultural moment yeah. not necessarily to have staying power yeah and I, I think that's true too and I just have to wonder yeah if you I think it's kind of similar to Lincoln like yeah if if he was just going to tell this one story, maybe we did need to editorialize this, the movie and just lose yeah. the beginning and the end, or I guess keep the end of this one. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Because, like, does it, did it actually work is the question I wonder. 
I honestly, and this is where it's always going to be a problem, and it's not their fault. It's definitely not their fault. When you have Spielberg, Meryl Streep, and Tom Hanks in a movie, whatever message you're trying to get across is going to be lost in the fact that you have Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and Meryl Streep. Because people go for the names, they don't go for the movie. And like, there's some of the very few people left in the film industry that still draw on their presence <laughs> alone. So, like, did it work? I don't think so because they had the wrong cast. If they wanted to actually get their point across, you need to lose the A-listers. But uh, they yeah. wouldn't have been able to make this movie yeah. exactly. in yeah. the yeah. time Total, that they I, were able to. But do I gotta it. be honest, totally if, agree. if I had known Matthew Reese was in it, especially if they had put Matthew Reese in more scenes, that would have drawn me to this movie far more than than a Meryl Streep Tom Hanks would. Yeah, I mean, but that's, I'm talking more for general audiences. We work in the yeah. film industry. We watch at least 52 movies a year just for this People podcast alone. People watch the Americans. They yeah. recognize him from that. Yeah, but like, I'm just saying, like, the, the cast alone, is the, A, how they got it made as quickly as they did, and B, yeah. why it made any money and any Oscar noms whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But I think if the story they want to tell and the message they want to tell, having that cast is immediately going to detract from anything just because of who they are. Personally is what I take from this sort of thing. Yeah, actors don't open movies like they used to. No, not at all. There's there's a very good articles that I will never attempt to even replicate that talk about the death of the names opening movies. There's only I think four left that can do it mm-hmm. in America. There's internationally there's a whole different rules, but American it's different. I think Jack we should move Black. to books. Yeah, Jack Black's the one. <laughs> he was in a movie with one of them. That's true. Um, yeah. Do you have a favorite quote? Favorite quote? Oh, actually, before we do that, I have to ask you guys: Did you did anybody watch any bonus features? No, I rented it on Amazon. Okay, um, so I found out on the DVD there's a there's a bonus feature that's called PSA. What do you think the PSA is about? It's about how Donald Trump's an asshole. No. Okay. Well, that's uh, all I have. Not to pirate movies. No. Like you would expect. I, I mean, none of you said. It. I, I expected it. It was like, oh, it's going to be like about the press, journalism, yeah, newspaper. Yeah. It's a non-smoking PSA because everybody smokes in the smoke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, awesome. that's awesome. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, that's my, one of my favorite things of watching period movies are just, hey, look, they're all smoking in their houses. Yeah. Your houses smell like ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, my favorite quote. It's a, it's an Odekirk quote, just because you know Bob Odekirk is in your movie. What well, something he's going to say is going to be my favorite quote because that's just what you get for using Bob Odekirk. <laughs> Uh, But this one's actually a very kind of, I think it's timely to today um, and a lot of people's attitude to today. Uh, He answers very honestly to the question that is posed to him, uh, wouldn't you go to jail to stop this war? (laughs) Sorry. Uh, And his answer is theoretically sure. (laughs) That's a very 2018 response of like, would you be willing to do this to save your neighbor? Well, theoretically, yes. (laughs) <laughs> it's not so theoretical anymore. Yeah. See, there's cutting stuff in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> that was my quote. I not apologizing. I was going to, but I already kind of did, and I didn't mean that one. So I should just let you know. Yeah. None of them were honest. I Force Gump rules. Um, I went with a t- I went with a <laughs> long Tom Hanks line because, uh, as someone who was in love with journalism until I actually did it, <laughs> didn't realize it's a lot of calling people on the phone, which I hate. Um, don't become a journalist if you hate calling people on the phone. FYI, just a thing. Um, or an office PA. Or uh, <laughs> oh <yeah>. god. Um, <laughs> uh, but it also speaks to where we are right now. Like it was a very, very timely message, like directly aimed out the TV at the the current press right now. And just watching Tom Hanks say this the same day that that op ed had been released, the same week that Bob Woodward released his book, hearing the president call the press the enemy of the people. This quote is very fucking relevant, and it's a. Uh, if, if they don't publish, he's talking about if we don't publish, it will look like we're afraid. We will lose. The country will lose. Nixon wins. Nixon wins this one and the next one and all the ones after that because we were scared. Because the only way to assert the right to publish is to publish. Yeah, we're about to lose that fight, I'm afraid. We'll I hope I'm wrong. Really hope I'm way wrong. Way to like immediately cut the passion in that with like depression with my my very pessimistic outlook no i think we'll be okay because like the one dope thing about a conservative supreme court is they're all constitutionalists and they really dig the first amendment as weird as that sounds like that's the one bit of optimism (sighs) that we can hold on to as i'm being put in my red dress and got to put my little uh handmaid's tail actually okay never I have to, there's some really cool shit that I'll share with you after this, okay. but it's, it's never going to be that dire either. Um, anyway, can I go since, you know, yes, you please my do. quote, um, 
Yeah, Newspapers? Her, apparently. Hold on a second. I thought you were like, can I go? Like, you were just like, I need to leave. Oh, God. I, mean, <laughs> I am, go. like, dripping. Oh, yeah, it's mighty hot in here. My undershirt was a bad idea. <laughs> my existence here in this room was a bad idea. Mm. Newspapers are the first draft of history. <laughs> <laughs> Dicks. You're going to say that one more time. No. Oh, fine. Newspapers are the f- first draft of history. Oh, that That's was a, a good, good quote. That, that was good. a good quote. That, was, a good that quote. was just the only one I remembered since you stole mine. Again, I don't apologize. I don't care. <laughs> I uh, we mentioned it in the podcast, but I like the quote uh, from uh, Sarah Paulson uh, when she's talking about uh, this the whole thing that Kay is going through, and just uh, uh, Kay's in a position she never thought she'd be in. A position I'm sure plenty of people don't think she should have. When you're told time and time again that you're not good enough, that your opinion doesn't matter as much. When they don't look, when they don't just look past you, when to them, you're not even there. When I'm, sorry, I'm, just, I'm reading this off, when that's been your reality for so long, it's hard not to let yourself think it's true. So to make this decision to risk her fortune in the company that's been her entire life, well, I think that's brave, and I just like her kind of. I, I, I like that she said it. It was kind of a, yeah. an awakening moment, and and I just like that whole conversation how it was couched. She's like, "Well, I'm brave," and then she just kind of lets it in into him with it. And I think the point's very good and something that not obviously we don't obviously think about. Was that everybody? Um, Did you go? No. Stop forgetting Elvis. I know. <laughs> well, usually I say, all right, next, and everyone's already gone. So this time I'm trying to just jump the gun and yeah. make sure that I'm not no, doing it this time. You failed this time. No, no. It's a big fail. Um, well, I think Elvis I... Elvis is hurt by it. I right. think he's fine. I'll, be, I'll live. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, I have the same... Uh, character flaw that Spielberg has because after all of those inspiring quotes, I want to leave you with a laugh and a smile um, because there's a great cranky Hanks in this movie. That's a whole thing that we didn't yeah. really touch on, but you can listen to my podcast for all of that. What's your podcast called, Elvis? Tom Hanks Giving. Look it up on all the podcast apps. It's there. Is it on um, Spotify? It's probably not on Spotify. Oh. Well, it's so not much, on there, but look at Apple so Podcasts. For all of the podcasts. Um, <laughs> Well, thanks for, for thanks for showing me up. Um, uh, but my favorite quote was from Hanks uh, when he's when they just get the papers and they're trying to make a move, and he talks to the reporters like, "How soon can you get this?" And he's like, "Oh, uh, by Thursday." And he's like, "Well, what if we were pretended you were a reporter and not a novelist?" Oh yeah, really. <laughs> such a good line. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> oh. Or when I love that scene where that one reporter's got the the fucking papers and he like tries to come into the office like, and Tom no. Hanks is like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> Cranky Hanks, he's the best. And that guy too, that reporter trying really hard to be like, "Well, the girl, she had a skirt," and no one's fucking listening to him. I love that, that he great. continued his thought. Continued that was so amazing. Just keep talking, buddy. <laughs> Someone might tune in at one point or another. Um, so for today's review system, we are skipping it because it's hot as fuck in here, and it I want to get done hot. with this episode. Uh, the paper. So we're just gonna move into plugs. Um, again. Venture Bros. Venture Brothers Podcast. Check us out. Uh, and then I'll let Sam plug her own show when we get around to that one. Elvis, anything to plug? Tom Thanksgiving podcast mentioned before. Uh, we are in Hank's Atis until his next movie, but we have the whole back catalog of every every movie. Hank's and- Atis sounds like a really bad disease. That's it the does. first draft of that statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking with it. Hank's Atis. <laughs> Hank's Anus? Hank's Atis. I have a really anus. bad case of Hank's Atis. Okay. You're in All Hank's right. Anus? Uh, <laughs> Man, <laughs> and what did you night. hear what happened to Elvis? He got Hank's anus. <laughs> and you can hear that anytime you listen to the podcast. It's great. Otherwise, follow me on Twitter at Elvis Kaboom. Cool. John, anything to plug? Just go to our website, rate and review us on iTunes and all that good stuff. Uh, I've got a podcast coming out. Uh, still working on the details on that. So uh, we'll later. Yeah. I'm booked up for Halloween. I don't have any time to do shit. So go to emilynolongersows.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's emilynolongersowsforyou.com. <laughs> there you can get on a wait list for emilysows.com. Emilyblakesows.com. Sorry. Emilyblakenolongersows.com. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get these websites right or people won't know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Build a Little After the Hype. <laughs> Sam? Um. So... I have a podcast coming out, or it exists. I don't, it depends on with, when this episode is released, but in the very near future. It's called Sam Wise. It's an advice podcast um, because I believe every question, and I literally mean that, every question in life can be answered by watching the Lord of the Rings Blu rays and their extended editions. So uh, if you have any questions, submit them to sam.wise.ath at gmail.com and tune in. 
It'll be on the same feet as after the hype while it finds its feet. And then it'll hopefully blossom into its own beautiful little thing. And it'll soar like the eagles that uh, show up conveniently. It's not a matter of I know. I believe, I'm, I'm okay. with you on this. Anyway, so, and you'll find out why if you listen to the <laughs> podcast because I actually do address that. Anyway. Sweet. <clears throat> and the I'm, other I'm here thing, for that. I'm here for eagle discourse. My next statement concerns you. You need to stand down. So <laughs> if you go to ATHpod.com, we also have a dope as fuck blog. Um, we That's post true. every Wednesday and most Fridays. Um, it's it's great. You should check it out. We have something for... And once Samwise starts, we'll have something for you every day of the week. You got Venture Bros on Monday, Samwise on Tuesday, a dope-ass article on Wednesday, After the Hype, the OG on Thursdays, and then Friday, a delightful little editorial. So, uh, you know, ATHpod.com, homies. And then we might end up with Saturdays and Sundays at some point. We might go crazy. I had an idea for a new thing during the last. See, this is, it just it just keeps happening. We're doing this, yeah. guys. Yeah, so you got to be here for it. Athpod.com for literally everything we just said. So much. Yeah. So Except much for Tom content. Hanks giving. Except for Tom Hanks and giving. Emily Blake doesn't so dot com. That's not that, a, that that is for a the thing. record. That is not a. Don't go there. You need to get. You need to. <laughs> buy, you need to buy that URL now. I am I so going to buy that URL. This could be your Saturday and Sundays, guys. <laughs> no, I'm just saying. Emily, Emily Blake no longer so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Emily Blake no longer so. It's a. It's a yeah, like a binary counter. Like is does that she sew today? Though, no, she doesn't sew today. It is like really hot. Yeah, we need to finish. So we're delirious. Bye. Bye.